Welcome to the Martin E. Siegel Theater Center here at the Graduate Center CUNY and to Prelude 21, uh, Start Making Sense. Um, it is our annual um, theater and performance festival celebrating the work of New York theater artists and ensembles and it's hard enough in normal times to create work for the stage and for uh, spaces inside and outside but in the time of Corona we all are faced with exceptional challenges and uh, we are here to celebrate again the extraordinary achievements that come out of the New York theater community. It is time, I think, and we feel, to start making sense to ask uh, questions. Why are we making theater? But also how are we producing it? And for whom? And uh, this is a great investigation again into the um, mechanics uh, of making art uh, in New York City and we also invited uh, theater ensembles from around the US from Detroit and Cincinnati, St. Louis and uh, Philadelphia, uh, New Orleans um, to join us and um, this will be an extraordinary look into uh, what is on the minds of artists right now. We also have uh, many panel discussions. Uh, we have uh, an award which we're giving out uh, to honor uh, uh, outstanding members of the New York theater community, so I would like to all of you to uh, join in and uh, get an insight of what uh, is happening. Welcome, everybody, back here to our uh, Prelude uh, Festival. It's uh, our uh, final, it's day five um, of the um, celebrations of theater and art uh, in New York City, especially, of course, theater and performance. It's been a great run. We feel we had um, so many panels, discussions, presentations, uh, uh, 12 New York artists, 12 curators put things together. We had uh, contributions from Detroit and Cincinnati, from uh, New Orleans and... Uh, and Philadelphia and uh, San Francisco. First time we kind of reached out and uh, we are continuing our investigations about a uh, vision and utopia for what can and should be done after this time of Corona or perhaps in this transitional time will be um, in this time. My name is Frank Henschke. I'm here at the Martin E. Siegel Theater Center, Center at the Graduate Center CUNY in Midtown Manhattan. And I welcome my colleagues. We have uh, uh, wonderful colleagues here in our system. They're system, the City University of New York. It is the largest uh, urban educational system in the country. I think up to 300,000 students uh, join every year um, uh, places where understanding is taking place or should be taking place. And, um, and uh, uh, many, many first-time students, first times of the generation, first time um, also of Asian American, African American, Latino, American, a great, a great service to the city uh, in that idea of a public school. Once it was really free, uh, it was called Free University, CUNY, at, at the time as in 1864. It was uh, started as a free ability for the kids of the workers to also go to school and learn something at a university level because they would never get into the big established uh, university like Stanford and Harvard or Yale. And um, it's been a remarkable uh, a, a journey in the 70s when the city really had to rethink its finances. It all got together, all 20 colleges under one big umbrella. And I think if I'm right from our meetings, we have about 20 to 25 stages and all five boroughs <coughs> and hundreds of thousands of people come. It's a bit overlooked in that commercial landscape we live in, but the service is enormous. And today I have with us uh, uh, John Jankowski from the College of Staten Island, Eva Bornstein from Lehman College, and Gregory Mosher, who is at Hunter College. And so it's a beginning for us to meet again after this time of Corona. We will also soon have an uh, internal meeting with all of our uh, CUNY stages. So welcome, all of you. How are you guys today? Well, happy to be with you. Thank you. Friend. Thank you. Thank you. And are you all uh, in your uh, in neighborhoods? Uh, John, where are you? Right this minute, I'm what? at home. Uh, I'm not at the college. Yeah, yeah. Are you at home in Staten Island or? Um... No, I live in South Jersey. South Jersey. Eva, where are you? I'm in Alabama, Manhattan. Um, 
because we're still working partially from home. Uh, I go twice a week back to Lehman Center, but uh, most of the time I'm working from home. Yeah. Gregory, where are you? I'm also largely working from home, and at the moment I'm in uh, Connecticut, in Litchfield County. Fantastic. So thank you. And so the idea is today to see what contribution, you know, has have these theaters made. I think, of course, it's enormous. It's a little bit in the shadow. It's a little bit like in a supermarket. You have the potatoes, the yam, the carrots. You know, they don't scream at you. Nobody makes commercials for them, but they are essential. They're good. They are healthy, and they are there, and they make great, great service. Um, John, tell us a little bit about you and yourself, and but also about uh, your your theater. Um, I'm John Jankowski, born and raised on Staten Island, and I uh, got into theater in college. Uh, I was in production uh, mostly for many years. I got into uh, film, and then I got an opportunity to work at the College of Staten Island 20 years ago, and uh, now I am the director for the Center for the Arts, which we have of uh, four facilities. Uh, we have a concert hall, uh, a, a theater, a recital hall, and a lecture hall. And there's also for the students a black box theater all in one facility. Fantastic. So what do you show? What do you show? What do you present? How does it look like normally, not in Corona? Yeah, time. I was about to say that uh, normally uh, we really have a, a, a diverse uh, season. We try to have some dance, uh, music, children shows, uh, rock and roll and comedy. I mean, we really try to do the gamut to try and bring in as much of audience of Staten Island uh, to find the niche that people want to see. And are you successful? Do people come? Yeah, I mean, it's getting it's getting a little bit more difficult uh, to get people to come out. Uh, they're finding other uh, forms of entertainment. Uh, if you ask me, the way that you know, same with films and movies are struggling uh, because they're so much easier. Uh, for someone to sit at home and watch a film. Um, now with streaming, I think it's gonna change the whole outlook of people coming to live performances. Um, you know, traveling from Queens all the way to Broadway could be something difficult for someone or from Staten Island to Broadway could be something difficult. And as we know, you know, all the, all the stages are now um, have capability of streaming, including for example, the Metropolitan Opera that never you know, had that at one time, but now it's streaming all their productions. And and as we know, they're struggling also with an audience. Yeah. So John has four spaces. Eva, tell us a little bit about you and your your your, your space and your success. <clears throat> so I was born in Krakow, Poland, and I started my career as an actress. I was doing films and theater in Poland. Uh, then I immigrated to London, England. I lived with granddaughter of Gustav Mahler for a while. Uh, from London, I went to Toronto, Canada, where I finished my studies at York University. And uh, I, right after <coughs> graduation, I was 24, I got my first job. And my first job was like John's job, running multi, multi facilities. 2300 seat theater, uh, 370 theater, 70 seat theater, 700 seat theater gallery. So I was 24, <clears throat> straight out of school. And basically, I was learning on a job. This is going back to 1975. Mm -hmm. So after Toronto, I immigrated to the United States. And I was a director of the Woodstock Opera House in Chicago. I started an all Mozart festival there. From there, I went to all over, you know. I, mm. I even went back to Toronto to curate the premier dance theater for dance. Great. So my then career ended at Lehman College. <laughs> so now I'm, <clears throat> now I'm in the Bronx, which is very challenging because you know it's a very specific community our community is very poor our community is extremely diverse mostly latinos so i had to switch my programming a little bit because i'm a strong believer like john is that you have to represent the community you know whatever you program is for your community you don't program stuff 
for yourself. Mm-hmm. So <clears throat> I had to learn a lot of Latino shows. And as a matter of fact, I started my job about 16 years ago at Lehman. And we started an all Latino series, which at that time wasn't so popular. People, It wasn't a mainstream series. But I took a different approach uh, because instead of going to agents, you know, and booking whatever happens and whatever goes on tour, I went directly to different countries. I went to Puerto Rico, Dominican yeah. Republic, all those places. Yeah, yeah, Eva, let's get into a little bit later in uh, to how we do it. Tell us a bit, what are your stages? What stages do you have? And then we go to Gregory in the introduction round. What, I'm what sorry, stages? but no, 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 that's I'm right. sorry. <laughs> no, no, no. So now yeah. we have a brand new, you know, because we just restored uh, $15 million we spent so Lehman Center, if you go on our website, you see it's a beautiful 2330 seat center. 20, 2300 seats. Yes. So we have to fill the seats. So you know. So this is a little bit of a different <laughs> and you have different all smaller stages around it, or is this just one? No, we have another theater on campus which is strictly designated for academia you know, for professors, students. We don't deal with those productions too much. We are mainly community oriented. In other words, we have the largest performing arts center in the Bronx, and we need to bring the people from the Bronx to our performances. Great, so in a way, it's the public theater, the the city theater of the- Yes, because it's the only theater of this size in the Bronx. Amazing. Gregory, t- tell us a little bit about you. Most people, I'm sure, will know about you, but tell us a little bit about you and, and where you are at the moment. Um, <clears throat> uh, I'm a producer and a director, um, and I've worked a lot of different places. I was, Eva, we were in Chicago at the same time. I started no kidding. at 19, in 1975, just when stage twos were becoming a thing. Wow. Because Everybody was figuring out that their main stage, they couldn't do what they wanted on their main stage. So they needed to start a stage two. So I went out there to do that. And from Chicago, I came back to New York and uh, worked at Lincoln Center for a while. And um, and then I ended up at Columbia after a, a gap running a program for the president um, called the Arts Initiative. And there are many of these arts initiatives in American colleges and universities now. Um, I think it was kind of a pilot progress program. If there were other ones, I didn't know about it, which was a university-wide program to engage students in the arts, whether they were lawyers or biologists or historians or anyone. It wasn't just for kids who were in the MFA um, arts program. Excuse me, my dog is being very rambunctious today. Um, um, and then I was at a party and Jennifer Rabb the president of Hunter, although she did not introduce herself, uh, walked over and said, uh, I think you should leave Columbia and come to Hunter. And um, I, really, and then we talked for about 18 months. And I, as I'm sure is the case with the three of you, the students are are just profoundly compelling. Um, and I, I had then and have now the feeling that these um, CUNY kids are the future of the American theater. You know, at Columbia, we used to sit around and say, what are we going to do? Create theater made by rich kids? Um, These young people have ideas, they have stories, and we're trying to give them the skills and the knowledge and the attitudes and values they need to go out and make a better American theater. Because this one, for all its strengths, has a lot of problems, as we've all been discussing. Um, I have two jobs at Hunter. I'm the chair of the theater program, and um, I started a professional company um, for my sins, the fifth in my life. Um, and a few years ago, we've done four productions. Most recently, Richard Nelson's final 12th out of 12 um, plays set in Rhinebeck, uh, New York, uh, three different families, all struggling, living paycheck to paycheck, all trying to make sense of the world, 
Um, we began rehearsal in very early August, and Richard said to the company, who knows if we'll make it to opening night? Yeah. We don't know. We just have to try, because the alternative is to do nothing, or to stream, and Richard indeed did several streaming shows very early in the pandemic. And it went well, so that's my life. I go back and forth between these things, but I'm very focused on the students, and the, and the professional theater has a, a very strong pedagogical component. Yeah, it's Nelson also up in rehearsals to the students, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And you also were at Lincoln Center Theater, so it's amazing how much you carry inside you the Columbia experience. A question to all of you. <clears throat> what do you feel, what is the role of a university theater? What role does it play or what role can or should it play in this city, perhaps especially after the corona? What, 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 what do you think about it? Um, John, if we can uh, start with you. Well, first of all, I want to mention, uh, Gregory, I, I am a graduate of Hunter College, so the graduates are out there working in the theater. Bravo. Uh, right, we are out there. Um, I, we, we have an, a policy at the college uh, brought, uh, started by president that we would have an access to the public, and that's what we tr always try to do, to make sure that they can come through the gates and, and use the facilities at the college, whether it be the sports and rec center or the soccer field or the, the if need be research in the library. And one of the other stronger places would be the Center for the Arts. Um, and we f try to find at the Center for the Arts to make sure that people know that uh, the space is available for them to use, whether they rent it for different events or uh, of course to be part of uh, uh, our season and come and see the performances there. Um, also, we really try to make it strong for the students to be able to be part of the center uh, and, and try to find uh, some students who like to do theater and want to do it professionally and hope to help them guide them in that direction. Are you connected to the neighborhood? How is it in Staten Island? Do people come? Is it kind of whatever said it's our public theater in the Bronx? Yeah, we, we mostly, my audience mostly comes from Staten Island. Um, New Jersey, uh, and, and depending upon the performance and the presentation, they also come in from Manhattan and, and Brooklyn. Mostly Brooklyn, Staten Island, and, and uh, New Jersey is where my audience comes from. So in a way, you, really, you, do, you have that function of a public theater, even so you are at the university and you're deeply involved in it. Eva, how is it for you? What is your vision? What do you want to do with your Lehman Center? Well, my vision is very similar to John's, I'm afraid, because <laughs> we are a public institution. <laughs> so we have a similar mission. Our mission is to provide um, cultural programming for our community. Sort of, you know, the borough president of the Bronx calls us Lincoln Center of the Bronx. So we more or less do what Lincoln Center does, not on a scale of Lincoln Center, because we don't have the funding available to us at such a big scale. But we try to bring ballet companies from Russia, from all over the globe. Uh, we bring modern dance. For, all, for example, we're going to have Polovdes Dance Company this spring. We bring very famous artists such as Smokey Robinson, you know, Andy Montagnez, uh, Gilbert Tosfantaros, because we have a very large theater and 90% of our income comes from, guess what? Earned income. Yeah. So we have to, right, John, we have to put bunnies into the seats, correct? Yeah. That's our big challenge. We have to spread the word. We I do a lot of interviews in all the newspapers. You know, I was interviewed practically by every newspaper in town, including New York Times, because I want to make Bronx uh, with a better, you know, better perception. Because people think, "Oh my God, Bronx!" As a matter of fact, I have to tell you a funny story. When we brought Johnny Math. There were a lot of people that came from the village, from uh, East Manhattan. And there was this gentleman that was like very close to me and said, oh my God, are we safe here? We would kill to go see John Mathis anyway, but are we really safe? Are we safe? Mm. 
Yeah. The perception of the Bronx was that, you know, it's not a safe place to go. Yeah, no, you really make a big contribution so to bring the city together. Tell us a bit, you got an award, right? Or you got, you were able to secure in the time of Corona resources for your theater. I was insane, basically, because, you know, on our state salary, I worked day and night to get that SVOG grant because it was a very competitive grant, you know. It was for all the presenters, all the agents, everybody. So you had to really be focused to get money because it was all over the country. The money was going to every, every theater, every bar, every venue. Mm. So I don't know. It was a miracle. Right? You got 700,000 or something. No, actually, we got over a million. Over a million, you know, which is uh, remarkable. And um, Wait, let me tell you, if we didn't get this money, there is no way we could reopen. No way. Because yeah. to reopen the center for us, right, right now, we, we open, open October 2nd, and we close to spending half a million dollars already. My goodness, yeah. No, yeah. that is really great that this uh, is recognized. Uh, we yesterday gave an award to the National Black Theater in Harlem. Um, who also said, uh, Shade, who got it, uh, our Prado Award, that um, she runs this theater. The Coalition of Theaters of Color, like 40 or 50 theaters, and they got a very big, uh, the, almost a doubling of the um, um, of the funds under Jimmy Van Bramen, the great politician who we also support, um, who said this is important. So there are some encouraging signs. Thank you, uh, Gregory. Um, you moved in so many fields also, in the theater, of course, but, if, you know, in different realities of theater, let's put it this way, you know, and often they don't like each other, the academics and the theater people, even though they should be feel closer. <laughs> no, we reason. love the academics, Frank, we love the academics. Yeah, that's what they all say, but it's true. But no, I, no, no, we, I, I personally would prefer to do experimental theater every day. So I often what's done in theater that, you know, there is this kind of not, this is commercial, this is public, this know, is popular, know. you know, but so Gregory, what is your vision? What do you want to do? What is, what, what, what? What keeps you going? What motivates you to do your own company and everything? Well, two things. The students. I mean, we end every meeting that we have saying, well, is it good for the students? It's we're just profoundly student centric. And the other is 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 just access. Um, for the for the Hunter Theater Project and the four shows we've done. The average ticket price intentionally has been less than $30. It was the only good thing I ever got out of Facebook was, um, <laughs> which I left years ago, but I crowdsourced a price that people wanted to pay to see some good data. And I had no idea. Everybody started asking me what I should charge, but I wasn't asking what I should charge. I was asking what you would like to pay. And it came to $37. And so that's what the top price was for Hunter Theater Project. They've moved up to $39.50 for the last one. And that includes service charges. I hate these service charges. You go yeah. to the ticket is $160. Oh, look, it's $192. For what? Someone, in, yeah, someone in Germany sued, actually said, what is the service charge? I put it in, I do my own booking, I put my card in, and it's a lawsuit, and they have very good chances that the service charge might be taken away because it's an additional price. Sorry. Well, that, mon that money is going back to the producers, and it doesn't count as part of the earned income, so the artists are not getting a royalty on that extra $20. It's unfair. Anyway, 100 Theater Project was a chance to take everything I learned Goodman and at Lincoln Center Theater and the National Theater and working on Broadway and touring to tiny little spaces, prisons and schools and, and, and AIDS hospices, to take all of that knowledge and say, how, always remembering that we have a pedagogical purpose as we call it. Um, what's the kind of theater you want to work at? And what's the kind of theater you want to invite people to? And it's not perfect. Um, but we're trying, 
And that's, that's the goal. I say to the students all the time, stop asking for permission for God's sake. Stop being up for a show. What good is it to be up for the show? Get six friends and make some theater. So a lot of our classes are oriented towards this and getting them used to the idea that, yes, they can rail at Broadway if they want to rail at Broadway and rail at capitalism if they want to rail at capitalism. And God knows they do. But it's, it's not moving their lives forward. So um, this semester, I've had an extraordinary group of guests, including yesterday, Ralph Pena from MAE, who was beyond inspiring, just thrilling. Um, the lesson of all of them is the same. If you make the theater you want to make, if you have an idea and have an idea who you'd want to do it for, you have a pretty good shot. Mm. Gregory, how do you get your funding? You get your funding from CUNY? Um, not yes, of course, we have CUNY funding. Uh, we have a lot of soft money. We have a major donor in Patty and Jay Baker um, who bought a building for our theater department. And uh, an amazing woman named uh, Susie Sainsbury, Lady Susie, Susie Sainsbury, who's very active with the RSC for many years and who's an extraordinarily generous person across the board, has been supporting Hunter Theater Project. It has other donors, the late M. Bass, is a donor, uh, Jody and John Arnhold have been donors, but it is primarily supported by one person who believes in this mission and who wouldn't believe in it if we were charging $80 right. to see a Richard Nelson play. She believes in it because the average ticket price is 27 This is very interesting because I don't know about John, but we get very little funding from CUNY. Our majority funding has to be raised and you know, we don't have big donors in the Bronx. Got it. Well, I, I, on grants, that's it. I should be very clear. There, no CUNY money goes, goes towards under theater project. Okay. That is all totally supported by right. outside donors. I was referring to the department because, of course, CUNY pays professors' salaries. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, so just to make it clear also for our listeners, and we have also listeners, I think, from around the world, uh, the CUNY theaters, basically, the CUNY has the grounds of the brick and mortar, and uh, we're never able. It's a poor system. It's chronically underfunded. We think it's politically motivated. Public universities don't get the subsidies they should for faculty, for students, for everything, but also for theater. But theaters at universities in the United States often take over the, the role of the city's theater, of the neighborhood theater, um, because at least there is a space, but it's very hard. It's not supported in a way it should be. And um, I think in this time of Corona, we have learned how important it is, how significant this is what we miss. And we all hope that it opens again. For the question to all of you, do you feel the time of Corona made you think about the work, what you will present, what you can present? Or do you feel, let's just try to get back to the work, it was already hard enough? Or do you, are you doing something different? Is the, does the community ask something different from you? We just reopened, actually. I don't know. We could be the only CUNY theater that actually reopened to the public. I'm not sure. Are you open in Staten Island, John? No, we are not. Yeah, we open we're, on October We're, we're open for classes. But oh, okay. with the lack of support that the college has for the Center for the Arts financially, mm -hmm. uh, we are basically independent. Uh, financially from the college. So to bring it back on the line, it's kind of a catch-22. How do you bring it back online with rentals? First of all, there's not many of them out there. Right. To support a staff that we had to let go. Yeah. And how do you have you know, someone doing contracts and box office and all the things that are necessary if you yeah. can't support them financially at this time? Okay. So at the moment, um, besides other issues for the, it, it, that we're having with the physical building, um, as you know, Staten Island had a hurricane come through right. and it flooded my concert hall and uh, the stage is now warped and oh. they're working on support, uh, fixing that problem. But well, I, I, I thought I had it hard. So Yeah, so we're, we're really trying to figure out how to come back. Um, and, and, you know, I, I'm assuming that the audience, you know, certainly want to come back. I'm hoping that they do. Um, I'm just trying to figure out how 
the college is going to make this turnaround. Okay. And, well, I think I, they're, my experience is that they're cautious. Nelson's play opened on September 9th. It got 10 just rave reviews. We only had 74 seats in the theater, four sides uh, in the round, extremely intimate, intentionally. Normally, those reviews would have cleaned out the run. Yeah. Done, sold out. We did end up playing at like 95% of capacity in a 74 seat theater, mm -hmm. but it was slow. It was day by day, week by week. Yeah. No. So that that was a big question mark. Are people going to come out? Oh, yeah. And well, we, had, we had vaccine obviously required and um, audiences were masked, but there is still real caution in the air. Yeah. I just attended a coalition of all the venues across the country. The average drop in attendance right now is 30%. That feels right. That's yeah. the average drop. 50? 30. 30%. 30 Three zero. Yeah. And I'm, I'm finding it uh, difficult, uh, I'm sure you are too, to have, make the place feel welcome to the public when you're stopping them at the gate. Uh, yeah. On the campus okay. and saying you have to prove your your vaccine or your testing yeah. or they're going to turn you away. Totally, we are having we are having great successes uh, because the obstacles that we're facing are huge. Like you mentioned, the gates, the lists, the tests, the masks. You know, CUNY invented this special form so they don't just accept you know, access your files. They have yeah. their own app. That app didn't work, Frank, for mm. our people. So, mm. And then they had to wait eight days to get accepted by it. Yeah. So how you sell a ticket to a patron eight days in advance? How do you have walk-ups? We don't. We, exactly. have, to, we have to have appointments. With yeah. our so it's been a horrendous October. But we got through it. We even managed few capacity capacity performances. Nice. What's the capacity in two thousand seats? I know it's amazing. No, we have fifty percent capacity, or what? No, we we had few sold out. Like oh, sold out. full capacity of two thousand seats. Yeah, I don't know how it did it. Honestly, it's who who was it, Amy? That's exactly right. Who was it? Well, it was Andy Montañez, who is very famous with Puerto Ricans. He's an old salsero with zillion Grammys. And the, the other artist was India, who is like a jello, unknown to us, you know, but known to Puerto Ricans. So she packed the house. Wow. But now we're having Jose Feliciano. It's a different story. Because our Puerto Rican audience, you know, they like to hear artists that are very popular in their countries, not in the United States. They have to be packed in Puerto Rico. So we bring them here from Puerto Rico, from, the, you know, Dominican Republic. We just don't, not that we could afford JLo or Mark Anthony, okay, that's out of the question. But... We do the second best. We go to the countries where these artists originate from and live in. Sounds mm. fantastic. Well, thank, you. Mm. thank you, Gregory. So, truly, this is not an easy task. It's yeah. correct. And honestly, I worked so hard, John, on that SVOG grant because I knew without it, forget it. Like, our security is tough. You know, we have we not only have to have the security of uh, Lehman College, but we have to have additional security, private security. We're spending fortune on private security, fortune, because the college, you know, CUNY is very cautious. They don't want any infections, so they're super cautious. Everybody has to have masks. Everybody has to be vaccinated. Check, double check. They have to have two vaccinations, not one. Mm. So it is horrendous, right? It's now. horrendous. And you know, it's also a legacy of a time 
where people thought it's a good idea to have 2,000 seats in a university setting. Often theater makers said, give me a barn, give me a basement, give me, yeah. give me a loading dock, you know, uh, it's yeah. something, you know, and you're struggling with the legacy of uh, bricks and mortar, you know, and yeah. no support for stuff, no support for programming, yeah. no support for workshop, no support for residencies. That's what you, um, what you really so really admire you that you do that great service in a way to to the neighborhood. Um, but what do you guys, if in the ideal world, you know, what do, what do you think? What is the mission of a of a city university theater? What should it be doing, or what? In case you would well, have the research, I think that city university Frank has dual function one is what gregory is doing you know which is to get students all excited and build future generation for theater which means that he's doing an extremely important job and two people like john and i are focusing on the community you know what what can we do for our community you know, Gregory has Gregory's mission is completely different what John and my mission is, because we have an academic you know unit that has its own theater. It has 500 mm -hmm. seats. They have their own director and they do a lot of academic programs. That's what Gregory is trying to do. You know, so in in our case, our mission is to keep the guns off the street, so to speak. Right, John? Yes. Get them into the theater. Focus on dance. Focus on, on something else, you know. Lift your spirit. The main yeah. thing after the pandemic, I think what, what our function is, is to make people forget the pandemic, even if it's for two hours. We are all sick of the pandemic. We can't wait for it to end. Mm -hmm. So we we allow our audience, you know, <clears throat> what was so moving is that the, for these two hours, people were acting normal. Because this is what people do. People social. People want to talk to their neighbors. People want to see live artists. They don't want to sit at home in front of a computer. You know, they want to be part of the action. So what we do, we, we taking them out of the house into their neighborhood so they can greet their neighbors, you know, and be human again. Well put. Thank you. John, is that, you know, Staten Island has the nickname Gun Island. Is that really? Um, Gun Island? Yes, that's all right. You know, was it was the news. It was a daily news headline. <laughs> Um, you know, guns smuggling and shootings and all of it. Oh, no, welcome to Staten Island. You, <laughs> do you feel welcome that? Welcome to Bronx. Uh, wait, wait, too many people. I'm yeah, sorry. do you feel, uh, as Eva said, is that something you you contribute uh, it, to the, the to the peace and uh, uh, and uh, freedom on on the streets, at all? or do you well, feel? I, that I, I certainly think that the college is open to, uh, and and one of the goals of the administration and the president is to make sure that the college is open and safe for them to, to use the facilities. And certainly we have 225 acres. So we have, you know, soccer field, baseball field, softball fields, a full uh, gym, pool. Um, beyond that, there's the theaters that we have, the library that we have. So there's a lot of, of activities at any given time. We have walks. This just mm -hmm. this past weekend, there was a, a walk for, I think, at I don't remember who, who, who it was, but there was, you know, a couple of thousand people on the campus for a, a fundraising walk. And, and I know that the president wants to make sure that that people don't just stop at the gates and just walk by. Um, they want to they want to make sure that people know that the campus is open to them and the facilities and, and the different programs that we have are open to them, not just in classes, not just the academic side. But there's a lot of things that go on at the college when we are in a normal working situation um, that is, would bring a lot of interesting uh, uh, things uh, to people to see. Yeah. Thank yes. you. 
So it, it, has, it, it has an incredible history, if I might interject. I think William Cody, or also known as Buffalo Bill, you know, the, the, the world first, what is supposed to be the Wild West Circus, in a way, if I'm right, started even on this grounds, which now the college where, you know, first buffaloes were exhibited and people from the city would come and then popular theater came out of their popular entertainment, whatever we would think of it today. You know, you would, of course, think today this is a racist. You know, at one time, Staten Island had multiple theaters um, yeah. that were working uh, both through the vaudeville era and, and further on. Um, but today we're actually bringing back smaller theaters. There are small theater companies on Staten Island. Um, there's a storefront. It's called the Victory Theater, um, and it's actually literally a storefront theater. Uh, I think it's twenty-five or thirty seats, but they're you know they're they're putting on shows. Yeah. Also, I would like to add one more thing, Frank and Gregory, that our function is also because we have the poorest borough of Manhattan. I'm like Gregory. We keep our tickets very low, as low as we possibly can. We also offer like ten dollar tickets to children and their families to a Nutcracker, for example, with the National Ballet of Russia. I mean, where can they see a professional Nutcracker for ten bucks? Right. You know, but we do that because they can't really afford to to go to the city, pay parking and all that stuff. Mm. So we fulfill another function that we make the cultural uh, events affordable to our patrons. So that's another value, added value to what we do. But I must say, you know, students, students at Lehman don't take advantage of these shows. They have to be forced to come, Gregory. Mm -hmm. I, I I agree. Uh, the, these kids are working so hard, and yeah, so, everyone yeah. on this um, stream knows most CUNY students have, they're all working. Most of them have full-time jobs. jobs to yeah. go on. So to say, take two hours out of your life to come see an arts event, is a, it's a, it's a tough ask. Right. And but I, I must also tell you that uh, you know, my Latino audience, I call them my Latino audience. They're not my Latino audience. Our Latino audience used to come just to the Latino shows. That's it. And I would go and say, hello, hello, because I go in front of the audience for every performance and talk to them. So if there is a feeling of intimacy and this is a house, this is not a roadhouse. This is your theater, your center. So I go and say to the fathers and grandfathers, just because you're Latinos <clears throat> doesn't mean that you don't know Nutcracker Ballet, okay? Your children are being brought up in this country and they have to know the basic classics, Swan Lake, whatever. You have to come and bring them because that is your responsibility for the new generation that is growing right here. Okay, you're not in Puerto Rico anymore. Okay, you really in New York. So you you have responsibility to your children to educate them. Mm -hmm. And you know the response has been tremendous. Wow. Yeah, put it in this way, it's important to remind everybody it's a global world and it's, it's a global world. In your own culture is you know, be right. open, hear exactly. music from around the world, read books from around the world, right. and of course there is you know, no mandate that the European one is more significant or right. more. Exactly. There are many, many, many things. Um, we, we got together because the idea of a festival and the idea is, you know, in the summer, perhaps we were thinking of 2023, how theaters, CUNY theaters can participate. And um, we just learned, I just learned before we opened on from Eva, that Lincoln Center is uh, um, having a, a very significant outreach uh, with over 50 institutions who have signed up. We didn't know about it to create a big summer festival. But what do you feel? How, if there is a summer festival, whoever organizes it, we help or they, it's done by a big, large institution. How should such a festival look like? And what, what would work for your theaters, for Gregory, for John and Eva? We say, that makes a difference for us. What would you like to see? How would you like to participate if someone has, you know, um, be part of that? What would, what would be um, of significance? John, maybe we start with you. 
Sure. Well, in, with my audiences, uh, our children's shows, whether it be educational show or an entertainment show, always does well because um, you're basically selling three to four tickets at a time. So it's very helpful that, you know, children and parents come. And like what Ava said, it, it helps grow the new generation of theater um, so that they get excited about it. Because a lot of times the younger children um, have never been inside a theater, have never, don't know, they know about television, they know about videos, they know about, um, you know, that and video games, those kind of entertainment. But for live performances, uh, it's, it's uh, something new to them. And I can tell you this, it's, it's not, you know, I, it, it gives me chills when we do a children's show and like a dragon comes out onto the stage and you hear the whole audience go <gasps> all at the same time. And you think, oh my gosh, they get it. They got it. They know that what this, it, it makes it exciting for them. And it yeah. makes them want to come back to the theater. You so, say, if you do a festival, think about families, absolutely. think about kids. Think about teenagers. Think about families going together yeah. in an event and sharing that as a memory of lifetime. So right. if any festival, this has to be a major part of it. Yeah, yeah, well, and it would also help the college itself because if you bring in teenagers and and parents onto the campus, they see the facilities and see what what's going on. When the time comes for a child to go, I'm thinking about going to college, they can go, no, I was at... A, a city university college, you know, and you got you should look at what's happening in the Bronx. You should see what's happening in Brooklyn and what yeah. they have to offer. It's not just about the big universities, you know, but the ones that that are convenient for them to get to. That that mm -hmm. would certainly certainly pan out for them. It happened to me. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's a good, that's a very uh, very good reminder, and I do agree, especially also in America, children. Children's theater, young adult theater, which is taken very serious in many country places in the world, Italy, Germany, France, um, so much more could be done. It's an ideal audience. And, and um, also it shouldn't be just the musicals, uh, which are, of course, very expensive and, and guide you. And then some people say, I'm not interested in, but the world is big. I think this is something to really keep up. Eva, what do you think if there is a festival you would participate? What, what would help you? What would you like to say to people who create such a festival? What, what, is, what does your neighborhood need? What does the Bronx want? Well, first of all, I want to change the image of the Bronx. So I would show the real talent of the Bronx and the real, real people of the Bronx. So this is your salsa music. This is your bachata. This is your hip hop. You know, this is what we are famous for, you know. We, we started hip hop in Brooklyn and then Bronx. You know, we started Cubans. We have a lot of Cuban artists. We would like to highlight the community, our artists in our community. You go to Lincoln Center, you go to Carnegie Hall. At Carnegie Hall, you hear the greatest orchestras of the world. But you come to the Bronx, you can hear the greatest Latino artists alive. Okay, and there is plenty of them. That you 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 won't believe how many Grammys these people have. They just are not known to the wide population. But you know, I went on television on, on Chuck Scarborough show with Paquito de Rivera, and Chuck asked Paquito, How many Grammys do you have? And Paquito says, Well, I don't know. And I said, Paquito, you have nine Grammys. Be proud, <laughs> you know, these people are very talented. So I would like to showcase what Bronx has to offer. So, so, yeah. so John says, keep families in mind, entertainment for every popular entertainment for families, which I very believe in circus also, you know, and uh, yeah, circus would be great. Eva who says, but, but our spin would be show the people, show the people, people who live in the neighborhood. Don't just import some on an airplane from Italy, France, wherever, you know, uh, um, and England sh showcase what we have. Gregory, what do you think in a festival setting? What you have such a vast experience. How should a festival look like? What should be, what should people really deeply think about when they create such a festival? Well, I think both ideas are great so far. Fantastic. 
I, you know, these festivals tend to be big, famous companies, right? If you think about the Lincoln Center Festival. Right. God bless Ariane Mnuchin and the Royal Shakespeare Company. Yeah. But there's other brilliant work being done in France and the UK, just to take those two countries. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, I don't know why they're the ones who come in. I suppose because they're the most easily promotable. Mm -hmm. But a festival that's celebrated both American, New York City, mm -hmm. There's amazing work going on in the country, in our own country, that New Yorkers know nothing about. Right. Um, and go to the most exciting countries in, in parts of the world that we're interested in, in Asia and Africa and Central Europe and Eastern Europe. Um, these are not companies that the New York Times are writing about. Um, but for the American companies, Again, just my ye yesterday, you know, because it was on my mind. I mean, they're really struggling. They're, they're like a month-to-month, year-to-year operation, doing amazing work to, to give them the certification of having, being part of a festival, and you're included on all the brochures and the websites and all that stuff, would be a fantastic lift for them. And you know, Gregory, do you remember in Poland under Grotowski, how fair this underground theater in Poland? I am I am of the generation that had a copy of the empty space in one jeans pocket and towards a poor theater in the other jeans pocket. Yes. Right. So I mean that theater grew up on a little. Of course. Stage. Of so course. exactly, there must be so many interesting trends in the theater, you know, that we are not even aware of. And, uh, that's, and that's right. And. and Focus that with unbelievable under your leadership. I'm sure you could find some weird stuff going on that it's world famous. That well, there, world famous. there are people who are very. I think Susan Feldman does amazing work out at St. Anne's, for instance. Yeah. Um, you know, she has a smaller space, right, 300 right. seats at the most. But she's she's one of those theaters where if it's good enough for her, it's good enough for me. Exactly. I'll just go out, right. even if I've never heard of the company. Yeah. Um, a, a, a festival organized along those lines would be very interesting to me. And I hope it goes without saying, 52 minutes into this discussion, that if the seats are not affordable for young theater artists and working people, not just students, but working people, yeah. can't pay $80, $100 well, right. a ticket. Right. So yeah, otherwise it's just preaching to the choir. It's, it's silly. You want to knock the American theater over a few clicks, you have to make these connections between aspiring theater artists, regardless of their age, and and interesting. Absolutely. And That's also, this pandemic, you know, people don't have big bucks to spend either. No. no you know, especially on entertainment when, you know, they lost jobs, whatever. You know, it's been difficult times for people. Yeah. Yeah. So tickets have to be reasonable. It would have to be subsidized for whatever reason so that it, it could be <coughs> beneficial to the community. Yeah. And, and you either have to get the times behind it, which is months and months and years of work and working connections, or you need to ignore it and do it absolutely neighborhood-based. The hell with the New York Times. We don't care about you. Because the focus on Broadway in that paper is, is disconcerting to me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Broadway's back. Broadway's back. I, they're my friends. I love them all. Yeah. But there's more to the American theater, <clears throat> or New York City theater, than Broadway is back. I know mm -hmm. it's a huge economic engine. I get it. Right. But there are other ways of looking at this. You're right, right. Gregory. Not everyone is back. Not everyone is back by any means. Yeah. yeah, and especially also institutions that serve neighborhoods, unique institutions. Yes. What if Eva wouldn't have had the energy you know, to write the application, to get the money? Stupidity you know? is the world, Frank. Stupidity and super ambition and being a complete idiot that I was because I sat day and night at that computer. Yeah. 
So the Bronx, which is the mythical part of New York City, would be without its public theater if Eva wouldn't have written that one. It was probably on her own in the night. It should not be like this. I think it's shameful. I think it's so wrong. And, um, and I think these CUNY theaters, 21 of them, or 25 theaters we have, you know, we have to find a way to be more miserable and also demand, I think, um, um, support uh, in this changing landscape, so away from commercial theater that is just about uh, you know stars. Yeah. Yeah. Actor comes on stage, people applaud. I think what Gregory said, you know, this small company from maybe uh, Lithuania, you know, can do something that makes us think. It's not yeah. sugar, it's not soda drinks. You know, it's good food, it's healthy food, it's sustainable. And so, um, and theater, as John said, for young audiences where families can go. The theater ticket is a hundred dollars. Family with two kids go, the grandpa goes along with transportation and food, it's $800 a day, an evening. Yeah, you that's know. a lot. It's wrong, it's not sustainable, it's gonna kill the arts ultimately. Yeah. <clears throat> also, a Netflix subscription for an entire year is $90, you know, and you can share it with three people. So um, we have to react, we have to do something different and away also from blue chip companies and they should also be there. But a new focus, especially after the time of Corona, where everybody celebrated the bus drivers, the supermarket workers, you know, the people who um, helped us, you know, to survive in the hospitals, the nurses. Where's the theater for them? It's a human right. It's a right to education, the right to healthcare, and the right to access to the arts. They should also get the support they need. And I think statistics that per head in the Bronx it's four dollars, and Manhattan is sixty dollars. You know what spent on. And it's uh, also like what we now say, you know, it's, uh, it's racially motivated and um, and this needs to change. And I think if anything comes up, if I maybe say a little bit, I didn't know about it. You just got an invitation from Lincoln Center, mm -hmm. a big international festival. I didn't know about it. I don't it. think it's international. I think it's the New York Festival. They want to uh, make it five. Listen, I only read one email. Yeah. And I immediately jump on it. Yeah. Because me, you know, I have energy or the whatever. So when something is happening, I'm on top. I'm on it. So I joined the coalition because I think it's a good idea that all the boroughs will be involved and we're going to showcase what we can do for the city, whatever. So it's not a stuffy thing. I don't think it's a stuffy thing. It's it's something that they want to highlight New York arts. Good. That's a great idea. Whatever it's happening. Whatever it's happening. Doesn't matter. It's happening in Bronx, fine. It's yeah. happening in Staten Island, great. So you maybe know. let's have a big meeting with all, a little bit more time up front with all our CUNY uh, uh, theaters and, um, and see how we can participate perhaps off with some of the academic leaders, you know, find something how city yeah. and we can get involved. And, um, you could spear the whole, you know, coalition of CUNY theaters. You could be represent the CUNY theaters and be part of it. Yeah. You know? or, yeah. or maybe people can that. Yeah. individually sign up. I don't know which, how you want to approach yeah. it. You know? For two years, we did actually a festival with CUNY theaters. It was in October. We said to every every local theater, yeah show the best what you have we put it together on a program yeah. Yeah. no yeah. funding the cuny central wouldn't even give us money for the postcard <laughs> it was a bit uh, disappointing you know also yeah. this we couldn't get but basically maybe we also weren't smart enough but i think now in this time of corona there's a new urgency and perhaps people will listen we have to organize ourselves like everybody else does and also <laughs> highlight the achievements the CUNY system uh, does, it gives, but it's hidden, it's a little bit in the dark. Uh, John Jay College always was a Lincoln Center Theater Festival, but they weren't even mentioned as a CUNY theater, you know, and um, they gave them favorable rates for shows that were paid by other people outside, you know, uh, Lincoln Center anyway. So let's see what we can be uh, doing. So I would like to thank you all for, for joining. We said we keep it to an hour. It's the beginning of a dialogue. So the first time that we meet after Corona and a couple of years of um, uh, 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 perhaps not paying enough attention to our system, I will organize a big uh, CUNY meeting and see how we can join existing things or create, create things. Um, John, Eva, and Gregory, thank you. I know how many Zoom meetings you had in the last year. 
and a half. I know this is just one more on the list. So um, it means a lot to me that you said, yes, we come to your um, the, our little prelude festival to think about uh, the contribution we can do. I would like to thank HowlRound, the great national um, broadcast, non-profit theater um, um, organization that provides uh, a platform for voices like ours. It's uh, uh, tremendously helpful to think things through publicly, to speak also in, in front of witnesses in a way. And, um, and um, we are going on today at uh, 3 p.m. We will um, talk to New York cultural institutions. We will have the Goethe Institute, the Asia Society, the French Cultural Services, the Canadian Museum. What are you guys doing? What's changing? How could you support it? And perhaps an international festival with our CUNY theaters? And they are very interested, actually. And um, head of the Goethe Institute changed the meeting uh, to be uh, to be part of it. So let's see what we can do. That a festival also have perhaps some kind of an intellectual, uh, dramaturgical, global impact. You know, in the sense of Gregory, what it said that we. Um, work with these uh, centers and then at five o'clock we have some of our prelude curators as you know we had 12 curators for 12 people we, we divided up that kind of power of the curator they made suggestions plus uh, one or two others um, to think about how should a festival really like and what should not happen what is already so wrong um, that we don't have Dilla Islands and perhaps you know uh, big, big, big uh, things of the sh sheds like whatever, you know, where people have make over $700,000 a year to run something. We feel, why don't you support what's out there, what already exists, where people have experience. So we'll, we'll kind of discuss that tonight is our last performance. This festival will still be online. Thanks to our Siegel team, Andy, Tanvi, Mumbai, Cactus Juice, we have to make that happen on a shoestring. It's a very, very... Um, um, ambitious uh, program we put together, but we got it done. I'm so thrilled. And it's, it's one more confirmation why such uh, alternative um, 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 public discussions that really don't happen, that they are out there. And um, as Gregory said, the New York Times and other, and all the other village voice closed, you know, there are no more time out New York, the real estate theater when it's getting smaller and smaller. We need places, uh, public places, to discuss the significance of it. And I believe America needs theater. New York City needs good theater. It's essential. And it's a city, the only city in New York, uh, New York is the only city compared to other Americans, where all the disciplines are. The number of artists in our city is so big compared to any other city in the U.S. And um, uh, people come to this city because it's a city of culture, because there is theater, arts, uh, visual arts, film, but it has to be supported. Also, we should make right decisions now and perhaps correct what is wrong. So thank you all. And, um, hope you join us later. And for you guys, we're trying to get a live prelude party together. So we invite you to come. We have to find a good restaurant and a little club to host us. So I'll see you all in person. Thank you, Andy, Tan, Jackie, and um, everyone in Cactus Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you.